Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, depending on your time zone. Um, you are at the Metagame Physician ICD-10 Coding and Documentation Essentials webinar. I'm Clint Hughes, the Vice President of Marketing with Metagame. I will be your host today. Uh, just a little housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, and I will be sending out to everyone uh, where you can get to yesterday's recording and slides and today's recording and slides a little bit later on this afternoon. So you'll get the recording and the slides for yesterday's webinar and today's webinar for you to pass around your office and to refresh, print out, use as a checklist uh, on your way. So uh, our special presenter today is our chief medical officer, Dr. Eric Beyer. He's an MD and he also has an MBA. Um, hello, Dr. Beyer. Hi, Clint. So why don't we go ahead and go to the first slide. Welcome, everyone. Uh, to start with the introduction, so I'm Eric Beyer. I'm the chief medical officer for Medigain. We'll also be joined today by Carl Johnson, who is our vice president of Western Operations. Carl will help us in the question and answer session, uh, addressing any concern questions related to uh, client service issues or operational issues. And then we also have Liz Jones, who's a certified professional coder. She's also Medigain's coding manager and our internal ICD-10 coding resource. So perhaps we'll go to the next slide. Uh, OK. Uh, folks, there is on your right-hand screen in that dashboard, you do see a place for questions. So as we cover stuff and you have a question, feel free to send it in there, and we'll get to it uh, at the end of the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Byer. Back to you. Great. Thanks, Lynn. So today's webinar really builds on the webinar we presented yesterday. So for those of you who were able to join us yesterday, the focus of that webinar was developing a transition plan. So we identified what are some of the key risks and changes to practices and what's a transition plan and a risk mitigation strategy. So today we're going to go in a little more detail on the actual ICD-9 uh, to ICD-10 coding transition. What are some of the key coding and documentation requirements for ICD-10 and how do they impact different specialties. So really this is a primer on ICD-10 coding and documentation. You'll want your physicians to do additional training. Uh, we'll provide some resources at the end. Uh, but because we're covering all different specialties, this is really at a high level. And you'll need to take this information and, and then also apply it more with specialty specific information uh, and some additional resources. So the first 10 slides or so today will be similar to what we covered yesterday. We'll give an overview of ICD-10, then we'll go over some of the key concepts, and then go into some examples and, and some recommendations. So first of all, for those who are not aware, uh, on October 1st, we will be transitioning to the ICD-10 uh, CM and PCS implementation. Now really, ICD-10 uh, comprises two different elements. The first is ICD-10 CM, which replaces the ICD-9 CM, and that's for diagnosis codes. So that's what this presentation is going to be focused on, because Medicaid just does ICD-10-CM. We just do diagnosis coding uh, for uh, physician practices. We don't get into the ICD-10-PCS, which is the second component. And that's really related to inpatient hospital procedures. So what we would recommend there is that you would work with your hospitals on their ICD-10-PCS transition plan. The other key point is uh, CPT codes and the HCPCS codes will not change on October 1st. So all of your current CPT codes and modifiers for the services and procedures that you provide, as well as HCPCS codes for medications, durable medical equipment, and so forth, those will not be impacted. So we're just talking about a changeover in the diagnosis uh, coding paradigm. Next slide. So from a high level, you know, one of the key things to keep in mind is that the changes will vary based on your specialty, on your practice size, on the type of revenue centers that you have, and so forth. So some specialties are impacted more than others. Uh, there are some codes that translate fairly um, directly from ICD-9 to ICD-10. And so if your specialty has a lot of those codes, you won't be impacted as much as some other specialties, such as orthopedics, where the musculoskeletal care codes now comprise about 50% of all of the ICD-10 codes. And the reason is that ICD-10 becomes much more specific than ICD-9. So it includes things like laterality, type of injury, and severity. And we'll go into more detail on, on that. But it's much more specific. Next slide, please. So just to give you a high-level view of, of what type of a change of magnitude we're, we're taking, we're going from about 14,400 diagnosis codes to around 69,400 diagnosis codes, so several times more diagnosis codes that we have currently under ICD-9. 
On the procedure side, ICD-9-PCS will be going from about 4,000 to 72,000 inpatient uh, hospital procedure codes. And again, it will impact different specialties differently. Next slide. So these are some of the key details that will now be needed in ICD-10. Now, not all of these will apply to each code or to each type of, of a situation for an ICD-10 code, but these are the, t the elements that you need to be aware of and you need to apply those to your specialty and the types of patient encounters that you see, the types of diagnoses that you render. Now, what's important in is that in both ICD-9 and ICD-10, if you can't arrive at a definitive diagnosis at the end of the encounter, it is acceptable to report uh, an unspecified code or the most appropriate sign or symptom, so that's no change. However, keep in mind, the whole point of ICD-10 is to get much more specific and more granular uh, in our diagnosis codes, so most payers are going to be pushing that you have the most specific code, and if perhaps you start off with a nonspecific code, that as you get more detail after the workup and so forth, you then uh, apply a more specific code, such as including a causative uh, agent for a, an infection or some additional details on manifestation associated with a medical condition. Next slide. The coding structure in ICD-9, we had three to five digits. We now move to three to seven digits in ICD-10. Uh, ICD-9 was primarily nu numeric. We did have some V codes and E codes, but primarily it was more or less um, pretty straightforward for a coder to look up a code because they were in numeric order. However, now that we're moving to an alphanumeric system, using a manual lookup is going to be much more difficult. So one of the key points is you need to have an electronic system for being able to do ICD-10 code searches, either as part of your electronic medical record or as a separate app for a smartphone or something like that. You'll see in some of the codes that there may be an X in one of the, the place places, and that's really as a placeholder for a digit. Some codes go to an additional detail, such as having a seventh carrier character for an initial or subsequent episode, but they may not have had uh, specificity on the sixth or the fifth digit, so in those cases an X would be used to uh, hold the place. And a key point on the ICD-10 codes, though, is if a seventh digit is required, so if this is a code that requires the encounter, is it initial, subsequent, or a sequelae, and you don't put that digit, that code will be invalid, and so we expect that the payer will deny it and send it back, and then you will have to provide that additional level of documentation or detail on the code so that a complete code can be sent out. Next slide. So this is what an ICD-10 code actually looks like. So the first is the category, and so that's in blue, the M84. So in this case, uh, we're looking at disorder of continuity of bone. And in the next couple of slides, we'll go over what are the different categories uh, that ICD-10 ICD designates. There's then a decimal place, and then we have the next three digits cover the etiology, anatomic site, and severity. Now that's only if applicable, so not all ICD-10 codes will go to all of seven digits. There may be some that are only four digits uh, or five, depending on the level of detail required. So not all codes will have all of these uh, digits filled in. And then the seventh possible uh, digit, when applicable, is the extension. So as an example here, M84.311A, this is for a stress fracture of the right shoulder. So the stress fracture right shoulder is covered by the 311. The M84 is disorder of bone. And then the final element is initial encounter. So you can see that it's really a layering effect that as we add additional elements and categories of information, that adds up into the code, and that's what the different uh, digits or placeholders uh, take into consideration. Next slide. So this is what the table of contents of the new ICD-10 CM uh, codebook looks like. So you can see, based on the number of codes, different uh, areas or different code ranges are impacted differently. It's more or less designed in an anatomic or organ system-based um, layout. And so as you, you look through this, you can see that some will apply much more to your specialty or the type of patients that you see versus others. So rather than trying to learn all of these different categories, you don't want to do that. You want to focus in on what are the key areas that pertain to your practice and your specialty and which are the ones that have the most changes we'll go through later in the presentation that you need to be aware of. Next slide. Now you can notice here, so there's a total of 21 chapters. Uh, notice on chapter 19, 
on the codes for injury and poisoning. We have almost 40,000 different codes, so that's a large component of uh, ICD-10. So the injury and the poisoning, we get much more specific in terms of causative agents uh, and elements. So that's where a lot of this detail comes from. So that's something that you want to be aware of. Next slide. In terms of specialty impacts, as we mentioned, because uh, so much uh, of the change occurs in the musculoskeletal system, orthopedic surgery is significantly impacted by the ICD-10 change, but also primary care, so family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, because practices tend to see such a broad array of patient presentations with different conditions, you'll be impacted as well. Uh, OBGYN is going to have a significant impact. We're moving to uh, basing pregnancy management codes on the trimester. Cardiology, we're going to see much higher specificity in the location of things like myocardial infarction, types of conditions such as atrial fibrillation, and also dermatology and ophthalmology will have a significant impact. Next slide. So this slide gives an overview of what we look like for some specialties under ICD-9 in terms of the total number of codes going to ICD-10. So for example, you can see in dermatology, it's about a 3.5 times increase in the number of codes in ICD-10 versus ICD-9. Uh, and it's about quadrupled for ophthalmology versus ICD-9. In terms of specific areas, there are much more fraction codes now because we get to a much higher level of anatomic specificity as well as laterality, right and left. Uh, poisoning and toxic effects are significantly higher. And another key change is in diabetes, and we'll go through some uh, of the key changes in diabetes. Next slide. So on this slide, you see some of the key elements and, and concepts that you want to be aware of and apply those, again, to your specialty and the tabs that you're going to be using that we went over in, in the tabular system a, a few minutes ago. So things like specific anatomic location. If there is a component of, of the anatomical location to the diagnosis, you're going to need to get very specific, much more so than under ICD-9. You're going to be looking for things like type of condition. Is it a primary or secondary condition? Acuity, so things like asthma really depend on the severity and acuity of care. Uh, under pregnancy, OBGYN, trimester, and the number of the fetus become more important. And then also the elements, other elements, degree, episodic care, and of course laterality. So these are things you're going to want to keep in mind as you're trying to prepare prompts and uh, templates that you might use to help you select if you're doing the selection of the ICD-10 code in, in your electronic medical record or as you're trying to construct a super bill and what are some of the key things that you need to be aware of when you're documenting uh, your, your uh, service for, your, for the ICD-10 code as well. Next slide. For injuries, so here what's very important is we get into much greater detail than before under IC9 for uh, anatomic location. So it's not only if it's at the head, so if you had a uh, head laceration, we want to get to the site subclassification. Is it the scalp, the eyelid, uh, where is it? You need to have the encounter. So for all the injuries, you need to make sure you document what's the encounter. Is this initial, subsequent, or sequelae? Type of injury, we now have more detail, as well as injury subclassification, and of course, once more, laterality, if there's a right or left component to the, uh, to the injury or, or the injured part. Next slide. More specifically on the encounter types, so initial encounter is, as you would expect, the, the first time that the physician sees the patient. Subsequent is the routine follow-up. And the sequelae is the visit the patient takes for any late effect uh, of an injury or complication of a condition, such as if a patient has a stroke and now they're having a late effect from the stroke. You'll want to make sure that you put in uh, the sequelae uh, designator as part of your ICD-10 coding. Next slide. Another concept under ICD-10 that's more prominent than it was under ICD-9 is linking of codes. So we have these combination codes. And the whole point here is to link clinically relevant conditions to more clearly show the severity. So one of the things to keep in mind is that you want to be as specific as you can appropriately based on the information that you have at the time in pointing out the severity because as we're moving into a value-based system of reimbursement, being able to show the severity of the patient uh, problems that you're managing is going to be important. And so that's where these uh, combination codes will be important. So for example, being able to show that you're managing a patient with right heart failure due to pulmonary hypertension will be more important to help show, again, that this is a more complex and higher severity patient. Next slide. Another new concept in ICD-10 is underdosing. So here we're trying to identify situations where a patient is not taking the medication as prescribed by the physician. So here you might have codes that would designate if a patient's not taking a medication because of financial hardship or other reasons. 
And so where this becomes important really is in population management. So one of the potential benefits of ICD-10 is that we can now uh, drill down into more detail on uh, patient populations. And so if a patient such as an atrial fibrillation patient is not taking their anticoagulation medicine, they're at a much higher risk for a stroke. So we want to be able to identify that and see how we can prevent them from not taking their medication so that they take any uh, anticoagulants or other medications that, that they need to prevent uh, adverse events from occurring. Next slide. Uncertain diagnosis, so this is not a change from ICD-9 to ICD-10. We've always told you avoid probable rule out, possible suspected, and, and so forth, because you can only code, uh, our coders can only code what is definitive, so what you can uh, put as a diagnosis with certainty. However, you want to code to the highest degree of certainty that you can. If it is a, just a sign or a symptom or an abnormal test result, that's okay. However, as time goes on and as you get more information based on your workup, so if the presenting problem may have been a headache, but now based on the workup you're able to diagnose it as a migraine headache, you want to put that additional level of detail. Next slide. So some of the key areas that you want to look at and see how they apply to your practice and the patient populations that you see. Uh, th this is not all inclusive. There are certainly others. But these are some of the more prominent ones. And we'll touch on some of these with some examples and, and some recommendations on how you want to uh, make sure your clinical documentation supports appropriate ICD-10 coding. Next slide. So the first is diagnosing or, or documenting an acute myocardial infarction. Now there's a differentiated between ST elevated myocardial infarction from non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. So you want to make sure that your documentation conveys that. Also, we have to get much more specific in the location. So identifying the specific coronary artery or arteries that are in affected by the myocardial infarction. There's also the temporal relationship with prior myocardial infarctions. So it's important with your documentation that you identify the date of onset, duration of onset, as well as any consequences of the MI. Next slide. Asthma, under ICD-9, we had both intrinsic and extrinsic uh, asthma. Those differences go away now under ICD-10. So now we're basing uh, the code selection much more on the severity of the asthma. But it's also important that you want to document relationships between asthma and any other diseases. So if the patient also has COPD, you want to make sure that that combination code uh, is, is utilized rather than just a, a more unspecified code. Next slide. Cerebral vascular disease also becomes much more specific. So now we have to differentiate as an infarction versus a hemorrhage. And we also have to identify what's the specific artery affected. Is it left or right? As well as any late effects or sequelae as a patient comes in for follow-up visits uh, after the initial uh, cerebral vascular accident. Next slide. Pregnancy, as I noted, becomes differentiated differentiated in that now we have to designate trimester uh, when we're doing pregnancy management. And we also have to link up with any complications as a result of multiple gestations. You'll also see more uh, specificity for things like high-risk pregnancy, fetal abnormalities, you know, labor timing, obstructed labor, those types of things. So as you dig into that uh, ICD-10 tab in, in obstetrics and gynecology, you'll want to look at those things and create prompts that will help you select the most appropriate code when you're managing these patients. Next slide. Documenting diabetes has some changes. So we have five different types of diabetes under ICD-10. However, really only type 1 and type 2 will apply to most physicians. So for example, diabetes due to an underlying condition would be if someone had a malignancy which is causing diabetes. That's going to be pretty rare for most providers unless perhaps uh, you're an endocrinologist. Uh, so really look at the type 1 and the type 2. But you're also going to have to look at diabetes combination codes. So there's a much greater importance now on documenting associated complications. So if the patient also has polyneuropathy, or if they have peripheral vascular disease, or if they have retinopathy, all of those will be in combination codes. And so you want to make sure that you identify that in your documentation, as well as if you're doing a code selection. You'll also want to document if they're inadequately controlled, or if they're out of control, and if they have hyperglycemia. In addition, make sure that you document insulin use. That's actually an additional code, the Z79.4. So any patient that's on insulin will have that code. So in summary, you really want to make sure that your documentation covers the type of diabetes, any bottom body systems or complications that are impacted, the level of control and hyperglycemia, as well as insulin usage. Next slide. Orthopedics, you can see now we have much greater detail uh, than under ICD-9 for the type of fracture. 
So for example, a pathologic fracture, we also need to provide the etiology. Is it related to a malignancy, to a medication, to osteoporosis? On the physial fractures, you'll need to designate the Salter Harris type of fracture. Uh, and then there's all the other types, you know, the torus buccal, green stick fractures, but you're going to need to designate the type of fracture when it's appropriate. You'll also need to identify elements such as healing, localization, once again, the encounter, is this initial, subsequent, or sequelae, and any displacement uh, of, the, uh, of the fracture. Next slide. So three other elements that can cross over into different specialties that you want to pay attention to are trauma and injury, infection, and medical condition. And so we'll talk a little bit more about each of these. Next slide. So in trauma injury, you have to be very careful to make sure you document the episode of care. Once more, initial, subsequent, or sequelae. If you don't have that, you will not be able to give a complete code, and we expect it will be rejected by the payer. You need to be as specific as possible on the anatomic location and laterality. You'll need to include documentation on the geographic location. So is this something that occurred at school or at work? And that could be a separate code, actually, that's, that's added on to the injury. Why did the injury occur? Was it a motor vehicle accident? Was it some type of an environmental uh, exposure? Was there a self-harm intent versus an accident uh, and status? So there may be multiple codes for this one injury in addition to the anatomic location covering things like the geographic location uh, and the type of injury. So you, but again, if you don't have the documentation, the coder won't be able to assign the appropriate codes. Next slide, please. Regarding infections, you'll want to note first the type of infection. So if it's a pneumonia uh, and you don't have the causative agent initially, if the causative agent is identified later, you know the type of bacteria, you'll want to designate that as part of the diagnosis. Uh, location, so as specific as the right lung, left lung, and so forth. Uh, any clinical manifestations or complications, so if the patient has fever or anything else going on uh, with the infection. And environmental exposures are important as well, in particular, uh, tobacco, so you want to make sure that you go ahead and designate that, uh, on, particularly on your pulmonary uh, patients. Next slide. Medical conditions, now we need to give the type of condition, you know, what's the origin or the etiology of the condition if we know it, any temporal course, so is a condition worsening through time or following a prescribed course, uh, is it a, with, what's the stage or the severity of disease, such as chronic uh, uh, kidney disease, uh, any body systems affected or complications, and any significant lab findings. So perhaps there's a lab finding or is sometimes even a radiology finding that may be something that uh, creates a diagnosis code linked to that. And then, of course, same again uh, with the contributing factors such as tobacco and alcohol. Next slide. On some conditions, you want to make sure that you identify what caused it. So maybe a patient initially comes in with anemia. But after you do the workup, you determine that it's due to chronic kidney disease or to chemotherapy. You'll want to make sure that your anemia uh, diagnosis changes from an unspecified code into that more specific code. Same thing on chest pain, being able to identify the etiology. On abdominal pain, you want to make sure you note the quadrant location as well as any associated symptoms occurring with it. Next slide. For chest pain, once more, location is very important, so noting specifically where the chest pain occurs, as well as any modifying factors or cause, if you have the cause. Hypertension, you want to make sure you link up with any complications, and so that will be with a combination code. Identifying if it's acute or chronic, and also identifying what's the severity of the hypertension. Next slide. So the important point here, if you are not familiar with the GEMS or the general equivalency mappings, this is a mapping system that's used uh, by a lot of the electronic medical record vendors to map from an ICD-9 code to an ICD-10 code. So it was developed by CMS as a mapping mechanism, and it's good and it's helpful. However, you need to keep in mind that most of the codes you get will be approximate codes, so they're going to be unspecified. Roughly 25% of the ICD-9 codes will translate to a direct ICD-10 code through the GEMS. So for those codes, you do get the definitive code through that GEMS mapping system. However, on the others, you will get an approximation or you will have to do an additional uh, extender uh, as appropriate. So don't just automatically go with an unspecified code that comes through a GEMS mapping protocol. And we'll give some examples on the next slide. So the first example under ICD-9, 427.31 is atrial fibrillation. Through the GEM mapping, uh, that goes to I-48.91, unspecified atrial fibrillation. However, if you can identify is this paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or chronic atrial fibrillation, 
you'll want to choose one of those, those two codes rather than the unspecified atrial fibrillation. On the next example, an automatic implantable cardiac defibrillator, here we have a direct translation from the ICD-9 code to the definitive ICD-10 code. So here the gem actually gives you the exact code you need to use. And then on the third example, where we have 425.4, other primary cardiomyopathies under ICD-9, that will translate to two possibilities under the, the, your gem. And so you'll need to determine if it's restrictive cardiomyopathy. If not, is it another cardiomyopathy? Or can you go to the extended, which provides a choice of dilated cardiomyopathy or an unspecified cardiomyopathy? A few more examples you know, under the orthopedic code. So the M84 is our disorder of bone. So here we have a stress fracture, location left humerus. And once again, this is the initial encounter for a fracture. So that's our A designation. Cardiology, I25.110. Now we have atherosclerotic heart disease. Note that it's of a native coronary artery, so differentiating it from a vein graft for a coronary artery bypass, and also that it's associated with an unstable angina. For an obstetric code, we have O09.11. This is a supervision of pregnancy, but the patient has a history of an ectopic or molar pregnancy, and it's in the first trimester, so we need to add each of those additional two elements in there. And then notice on the injury code, the degree of specificity that we get that we're actually noting that this was an injury that occurred uh, by striking against or struck by a football helmet and again at the initial encounter. Next slide. So here it gives an example of a diabetes presentation where you have multiple codes. So diabetic with chronic kidney disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, they're taking insulin. So this would translate into three ICD-10 codes. The E11.22 designates that this is type 2 diabetes with diabetic chronic kidney disease. The N18.3 tells us what is that chronic kidney disease. It's stage three, so now we know the severity. And then the third diagnosis, the Z79.4, tells us that this is a patient who uses uh, insulin on a recurring, a recurring basis. Next slide. So next, I'll turn it over to Liz. And what she's going to go through are a couple of examples from CMS. So this is actually from the CMS website. We've given you a link under our resources. And here's where they're going through some cardiology clinical scenarios. So this is a resource that I would recommend that physicians use and walk through some of these examples so they understand the underlying concepts of ICD-10 uh, as it pertains to their specialty. But Liz will walk you through a couple of examples from a coder perspective and what she needs to see or coders need to see uh, in your clinical documentation so that they can code appropriately. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Byer. The first scenario that we're going to discuss is related to hypertension. The patient is an 81-year-old male scheduled for a TERP in five days. He's come to the doctor um, presenting with needing his hypertension checked prior to surgery. The patient has a history of essential hypertension and was prescribed blood pressure medicine once a day by PCP, but patient is not taking as he can't afford it. Um, the exam element that is relevant to the ICD-10 is labs show creatinine at 1.5, a slight increase from his baseline, and possibly indicating early renal insufficiency. And in the assessment and plan, the statements hypertension is likely due to patient's noncompliance and uh, reevaluate the hypertension in three days. If improving, he's cleared for surgery. So the highlighted options on this hypertension case are what's relevant to the ICD-10 case study. Next slide, please. As you can see, the clinical documentation that is directly impacts ICD-10 was what was highlighted, and it states that the documenting why the encounter is taking place, so stating that it was either a routine visit, surgery clearance, or an initial visit is very important. Um, if it's known, uh, we can use the underdosing now, because that is a new code that's provided by uh, the ICD-10. Um, so with the usage of the other dosing code is also important to put why the patient is being non-compliant. So for instance, in this case scenario, the patient is being non-compliant because they cannot afford their medication. Documentation indicates a lab result that is abnormal, and the guidelines allow for that to be coded as well. 
and then an ICD-10 coder um, are provided the use of the additional code set. Note under the hypertension diseases, if known, document whether or not the patients have the following exposure to environmental. Um, tobacco smoke, history of tobacco use. So if we had a patient that did have a history of tobacco use, we would be allowed to go ahead and um, code that as well. However, in this case scenario, they did not. So as you can see, there is a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the hypertension, the abnormal EKG, the abnormal results for the function study of the kidney, and an old myocardial infarction from ICD-9 to ICD-10. The new codes that you would use for this are the underdosing and why there was underdosing, and then the preoperative cardiovascular examination does code out one-to-one -one from an ICD-9 to an ICD-10. Next slide, please. The next case scenario we're going to discuss is syncope. The patient has been dizzy, weak, and feeling tired the last few days. He reports passing out at school. Um, some of the key elements in the history that relate to ICD-10 are the patient had three several second witnessed syncopal episodes at school yesterday, went to the university clinic and was referred by a nurse. The patient states no palpations, no palpitations, no tachycardia, and no blurred vision noticed prior to each episode. Um, also relevant to the history and the ICD-10 coding is the fact that the patient um, admitted that he had to lose 11 pounds and had been purging. Um, essential exam elements for this case study are the orthostatic vital signs and the EKG showing tachycardia. On the assessment and plan, essential ICD-10 elements are ordered nutritional consult for dietary intake, physical activity, and potential bulimia. Next slide, please. As you can see, the ICD-10 codes cross one-to-one -to, -one to the ICD-9 codes. Since the etiologies for syncope and collapse scenarios are multifactorial, it is important that clear documentation um, is used to support your clinical thinking and judgment. Quantify the number of syncope or presyncopal episodes as they did in this case study. Note if purging behavior is reoccurring or if it's a one-time occurrence. Um, in this case, the patient was trying to lose 11 pounds, so note whether or not that, that this is something that's recurring or has happens only once. Note the orthostatic hypotension readings. Um, Ideally, if the note is to stand alone, then more details need to be provided to document sinus tachycardia. So there could have been more details added for the tachycardia as well. All right, back to you, Dr. Barr. Great. Thank you, Liz. So on the next slide, uh, this actually came from the American Health Information Management Association as they've been uh, going through uh, reviewing different physician uh, groups and I think doing some consulting. What did they see as the most likely causes of ICD-10 documentation deficiencies? And I think these are, are pretty much in, in order of expected prevalence, so the one would be most common. So these are things that uh, I would advise uh, each group would want to look at and try to create prompts either in their electronic medical record uh, or perhaps some laminated cards or other things. As you, uh, you know, look through uh, ICD-10 codes that apply to your specialty, you want to make sure you try to avoid these types of problems. So, for example, uh, making sure that when you uh, document the disease type, that if there is any um, associated condition or, or etiology that's noted, so acute renal failure with tubular necrosis, you want to document that. Uh, same thing on disease acuity. Uh, site specificity is very important making sure that if you know the stage of the disease that you document that and then also make sure that there's enough information there to uh, in your documentation for combination codes so that the the coder can select the appropriate combination code because what's very important is if it's not documented it's not done so coders cannot infer or assume uh, relationships or create combination codes if there's not strong supporting documentation so for coding education what I recommend for groups is start with your specialty society. So I would recommend one of the first things you do, if you have not done it already, go to your specialty society web night, website, uh, put ICD-10 in the search box, and see what types of resources your specialty society offers. Do they offer uh, training webinars? Do they have resources or articles that, that people have written? I've seen some specialty societies have some very good articles 
Uh, for example, American Academy of Family Practice has a nice uh, two or three page article on diabetes and, and documenting that. Um, can you go back to the first slide, please, Clint? I'm sorry. And hospital training sessions. Uh, one of the key resources that groups may have available to you is your hospital. So if you have a chief medical officer or coding resource at the hospital, utilize uh, those people because they can be very helpful. There are a number of different online education uh, resources. So CMS and American Medical Association have some. In addition, American Health Information Management Association and American Academy of Professional Coders. Um, I like the AAPC. You know, one of the first things I recommend for all groups is go to the AAPC website. And we give you a web link uh, in our resources uh, list here, and identify and pull down for your specialty the top 50 ICD-9 uh, codes linked to ICD-10 codes. It only costs about $25 for non-members. It can be very helpful as you're trying to uh, redo your super bill if you're going to stick with a, a super bill. Uh, but also AAPC has three-hour webinars that are specially specific for physician training. So after hours, physicians can go through these webinars uh, and learn about ICD-9 uh, to ICD-10 transition and documentation coding for their specialty. And then also look to how can you create various cheat sheets, uh, EMR template updates, and, and perhaps even some standalone apps for your smartphone. Uh, one that we've identified that looks pretty good is, is from Precise, and we'll give you the link for that also. Next slide. Best practices, one of the keys is make sure you have a physician champion for training and feedback. Ideally, this is someone within the practice, and you can utilize a train the trainer um, aspect. So maybe one of the physicians becomes more proficient in appropriate ICD-10 coding and documentation, and he or she can then help uh, with the education and uh, creating a resource uh, feedback and, and so forth for the other providers uh, in, in the practice. If not, look again to your hospital. Do they have a, a chief medical officer or someone that would be able to uh, serve as that outside resource or champion? But one of the providers, ideally a physician, needs to be a key driver on making sure that the practice does what's needed for provider education for ICD-10, uh, updating the uh, electronic medical record templates and so forth to make sure that the providers are responsible and accountable for getting done what they need to. You want to utilize and identify computer-assisted tools uh, that would be helpful as well as the specially specific uh, feedback uh, mechanisms. And finally, at the end, or the, the final bullet, make sure you have ongoing feedback. So this is not a one-time education uh, thing where you, you just do a webinar and then you're done. You want to make sure there's ongoing feedback. You'll be getting denials after October 1. You want those denials feedback to come to the physician so they can see what needs to change in their documentation or their coding habits, or if there's a medical policy that's changed that they need to be uh, aware of when they're coding and, and documenting services. So this is going to be an ongoing effort, not only before October 1, but after October 1. Next slide. So key points, take action now. So if you've been a procrastinator, now really is the uh, last minute, and you really do need to get started on your education efforts. Uh, if your practice has not started a transition plan, refer to the webinar we gave yesterday. Uh, it's got a good framework for how your practice can start uh, moving to the, the uh, ICD-10 transition, breaking it into to pieces. Uh, get the, the top 50 codes for your specialty from the AAPC. You should also do uh, identify, so most practice management systems can run a report where you'll get your top 20 ICD-9 codes, map those over with GEMS or another mechanism to what are the appropriate ICD-10 codes, and then you can use the two of those, so the top 50 from AAPC and the top 20 from your practice, so that if you need to update your super bill, if you're still going to keep a paper super bill, what are the key diagnoses that you need to put on that? And maybe you create a laminated card for the additional diagnoses that uh, don't fit on the one page. Make sure the providers take education courses, whether it's online or in person. You can use coding consultants. You can use hospital resources. But make sure the education takes place as soon as possible. And then you do some case studies around that. And then also make sure that you do chart audits. So once the education has taken place, we want to audit and make sure that the clinical documentation of our providers does support the appropriate ICD-10 codes. Next slide. Make sure you learn the functionality of your electronic medical record software as it pertains to ICD-10. So as I mentioned, a number of vendors are using the GEMS mapping uh, functionality for selecting an ICD-10 code in their uh, electronic medical record. Make sure you understand how those pick lists will be developed and how you can most efficiently um, and, and productively use those tools so that you're uh, good with them, well-versed with them when October 1 comes rather than you're seeing them for the first time. 
Some systems like I know Advanced MD even has a practice data set that you can sign up to use and so you can practice with ICD-10 codes prior to October 1. And if you don't do that, I would at least recommend that practices do some case studies. So perhaps you take a uh, one of your top 20 codes and all the physicians in the group sit down at lunch and go over one or two of those at least every week so that you can start to understand, you know, is the documentation sufficient to do all the ICD-10 coding or are there uh, gaps and things that we need to have additional education around. Next slide. Uh, we talked about yesterday how you need to make sure you update any form. So in addition to the super bill, pre-authorization forms or advanced beneficiary notices may need to be updated to accommodate ICD-10. Uh, you may also need to update both your clinical as well as your administrative processes. You know, where are bottlenecks potentially going to occur that you want to watch for those or, or try to prevent those? But make sure that you have some type of post-transition monitoring. You want to monitor the uh, denials that you're getting. You want to monitor your payers for any additional uh, information that they provide related to uh, new claims edits, new medical policies and procedures, pr new pre-authorization requirements or triggers. All of that is going to be very important that you not only identify that, but also that you share that information with Medigain with your client service team so that we're aware of it as well because oftentimes payers will send information to the office of a physician uh, and will not be able to see that information unless the office forwards it on to us. Next slide. So this is the list of resources. Again, start with your specialty society. Utilize resources from your electronic medical records or your practice management software vendor. See if they have any tutorials so you can learn to use the functionality. Go to the payer websites or contact the payer chief medical officer. Identify any training tutorials on ICD-10 or any updates on how they're going to be uh, transitioning to ICD-10, what's going to change. Uh, going through the list of resources here, uh, the first one is Crozier Keystone. I saw that they had what I thought were some pretty good, specially specific um, ICD-10 related tips and uh, resources, including some apps that you can use for either an iPhone or a an Android, so that may be good. Uh, Precise is another uh, potential uh, mobile solution. Road to 10, that's actually by CMS, so they give specially specific uh, webinars that you can uh, have the physicians walk through. They have a basics course as well as the scenarios, uh, some of the examples uh, Liz went through. And then you have the various other organizations here um, that you can go to their website and identify what's the most appropriate ICD-10 resource that you can use for your practice as well as your specialty, and including, again, at, at the bottom there, here are a couple of the uh, software vendors. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to Clint. We've left enough time that uh, we can take some questions. Great. Uh, well, uh, we are getting questions, and there on that dashboard on the right, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see the section that says questions. And while we are compiling those, uh, I'll ask uh, Carl Johnson, our VP of Client Services, if there's uh, anything that he'd like to point out. Carl? Great. Just did want to... Uh remind everybody we're talking about it being about six weeks away uh, that doesn't mean it's time to panic it is time to take action we think that there is um, you know still still time for people to learn how to um, utilize ICD 10s and I like to recommend that people take advantage of training at local hospitals it can be more specific and local also uh, have uh, your docs think about it like studying for an open book test there's no way to memorize 60,000 codes, but understanding how to look them up, having the tools available uh, will certainly be beneficial to you. Back to you, Clint. Great. Thanks, Carl. Uh, and I've gotten some emails. If you did not get an email yesterday uh, with a, li a link to the recording and the slides, send an email to marketing at metagame.com because I'll be using that same list to send out the stuff uh, this afternoon. I want to be sure you get both. Uh, here we have a question. Um, for mental health diagnosis codes, does additional information other than the code itself need to be provided? In other words, does a narrative need to be provided as to how that diagnosis was reached? Eric or Liz? Liz, do you know on that one? Um, I don't know specifically how much documentation has to be had for those. However, I do know that um, Behavioral codes typically have some combination codes, so you, if you have bipolar with schizoaffective, then that's a combo code. So it is always best to list at least, if they have different types of mental illness, which ones they have so that if there are combo codes that exist, that they can be put on there. So there's, it's never wrong to put all the details in the, in the documentation. 
Okay, great. Uh, here's another question. How would you code something if you do not know the details of it, for example, uh, the prior unspecified category? So here, here again, you can still use unspecified code if that's the most appropriate based on the information you have. Um, however, you just need to be aware that if additional specificity is possible based on either lab information or you have causative agents of an infection, that type of thing, you need to put it as specific as possible. However, you can't put, you know, don't make stuff up. So if you don't have the information, then you may need to just go ahead and use an unspecified code until you do have more specific information that would allow you know, a more detailed and, and, and uh, appropriate code. For example, if you're an ED or an urgent care, somebody comes in with chest pain, you're typically going to send them to a higher acuity level center. So the unspecified code for chest pain may be the only thing that you have because you don't necessarily know what's going on with them at that time. So we would use the unspecified code in those types of situations. Okay, great. Uh, somebody asked about going into more detail about the handheld programs. And here in the live link that I'll be sending you, uh, sending you to, here's the one for precise what we talked about. And Carl, you're the one that originally found that. And Dr. Beyer, I know that you've been playing around with it. So uh, I'll let you guys kind of explain a little bit more about how this works on, on the mobile phone. Yes, this is Carl Johnson. Uh, Precise is a company who provides uh, ongoing training services and support for ICT-10. And they have developed this application for an Android or an iPhone um, that you can download. It's, I think, less than $8. And it really kind of helps a physician by starting to type in uh, a narrative section on the diagnosis, narrow things down to where you can get an ICD-10 code. Eric, did you want to jump in on that? Uh, no, I, I think that that's pretty good. You know, the one, uh, the link from Crozier Keystone above that lists other types of, of uh, uh, potential apps as well. So what I'd recommend is that the physicians would look at Precise, look at some of those other apps, and based on the type of phone you're using, you know, see what's available. Some of them start off with a free version, and then you can upgrade to a you know monthly or a, a one-time fee version. So a lot of it really does come down to you know what you're comfortable with, how you want to use it, and what type of phone you have. It is a lot and, of personal and, preference on how you use these. Right, right. Good for iPads, too. Okay, we have another one. I think this one's for Liz. Other than the diagnosis code, do narratives need to be provided uh, on our claims to the payer? You might uh, be on. Not for the diagnosis coding, no. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, can now. We can now. Okay. So, um, in regards to diagnosis codes, no, there would not be any narratives on the billing for those types of codes. They they stand for themselves as the narrative. Okay. However, this is our one thing you may want to be aware of, though, is we don't know what impact this is going to have on various compliance initiatives that payers may have. So they may do some audits and may ask for documentation to support uh, some of these codes. So again, you want to make sure that the documentation does support any of the codes that are selected. Carl, jumping in here, you know we've certainly seen Medicare and other commercial payer, payers um, ramping up the number of chart reviewing um, to make sure that the documentation supports the CPT codes that were billed. You know, my feeling is is that we're also going to see the insurance companies now looking at these diagnosis codes with lots more specificity. You know, on ways to not pay claims, or in their opinion, to pay claims more appropriately. So I think that it is going to be critically important that the documentation, the narrative pieces in the medical record, does substantiate the diagnosis code chosen. And in many specialties and many physicians, that's routine, matter of habit for them. They've always done that, always will do that. But I think there's some others who are just going to write down diabetes in the note, you know, in two words or three words, and they'll need 20 words in order to get enough specificity in there. So definitely recommend uh, erring on the side of being more specific. No, that's great. That's very informative, Carl. Uh, we still have time for a couple more questions, folks. So it's right there on the right in that dashboard, questions. Uh, as I said, if you did not get an email with uh, yesterday's recording and slides, send an email to marketing at metagame.com, and I will be sure that you get one today. The email I'll be sending out today will have links to yesterday's and today's recordings and slides, plus 
live links from that uh, resources slide that you saw. So it uh, doesn't look like we have uh, any more questions coming through, but uh, I'll just ask for a, some parting comments, and we'll start off this time with uh, Liz. Um, I just want to, you know, reiterate the documentation is king on these. You know, you cannot go wrong by adding details to your documentation. And like Carl was stating, I believe that, you know, down the road we're going to be looking at payers trying to deny claims based on the diagnosis not being specific enough or, um, you know, really wanting to target those diagnoses to pay or maybe even, you know, looking for those for auditing. So documentation, documentation, documentation. Can't emphasize it enough. Coders are not allowed to infer anything, so if it's not there, we can't code it. Great. Okay. Carl? I would also say that if you are using an electronic medical record system, familiarize yourself with how IC-10 is supported in it. If you're not using an EMR, it's probably too late to get set up and running for October 1st, but down the road it will probably save you um, some significant energy in coming up with ICD-10 codes. The other thing I would mention is that there are still some practices who are submitting information to us on paper super bills. Now that there's dozens of types of type 2 diabetes, as Dr. Byer said, writing diabetes on the bottom of the super bill is not going to suffice any longer and we really need to give us the alphanumeric codes for the ICD-10 codes. Thanks, Quinn. Great. Oh, you bet. And Dr. Byer. Yeah, just a couple of final comments. So the first is um, the ICD-10 transition, I know for a lot of practices, particularly small and mid-sized practices, may look daunting. And so that's where it's important you can manage it. One of the key things is go back to some of the things we presented yesterday, break it into pieces, and start tackling each piece. Make sure you have a plan for your providers to get educated. Make sure you plan for the increase of potential of denials and so forth. So you can get, a, get through this, but you need to start now. The second point is you know, this is a team effort. So we at Medigain are here to help you. You've got the client services team, Carl and, and his team, I want to work with our, our clients on making sure we have good processes for getting billing information back and forth. So if we get denials, we need to get that clarification of information from our practices and get it in a timely manner. So we need to work together, but we're really going to depend on the practices to provide us the information that we need in order to bill correctly, as well as then make sure that we can get denials resolved to get the payers what they're asking for so that we can get the claims paid. So please make sure that you, you work closely with your Medigain client services team uh, to give us the payer information and updates that you receive, as well as on your billing uh, information flow processes. Thanks, Clint. Great. And uh, we had a question on yes at marketing at metagain.com. Uh, it can be all lowercase letters if that's easier for you. If you didn't get the yesterday's email, send that to me, uh, and I'll make sure that I get everybody's email from your registration and when you send me questions. Uh, I'd like to thank. Dr. Byer once again, uh, Carl Johnson, and Elizabeth Jones for their participation in this very informative webinar. Be on the lookout for more webinars and helpful eBooks uh, to help you get through this transition. Uh, this is Clint Hughes, thanking you very much, and be on the lookout for an email from me with uh, the links to the recordings for yesterday and today. Thank you all very much.